Now up on the Short Time Wrestling Podcast with the new assistant coach at Oregon State University, Josh Roden, not wasting any time. He won a fourth straight national championship as a head coach, as the head coach of the Cougars of Clackamas Community College right down the road in Oregon. And uh, Josh, you know, when the announcement came out that you were joining the staff, uh, kind of kind of raised some eyebrows a couple people, and those who know you are not really surprised by it. But what was yeah. more surprising is you're already on the job. You waste no time here. You're like, peace out, I'm gone. Thanks for the memories. You know, it was harder than that. Maybe the hardest professional decision I've ever made uh, and the hardest conversation I've ever had with a group of young men. Uh, so so uh, while that is true, it was quick turnaround to get down here uh, kind of by design. I don't want to recruit kids, uh, you know, under the premise that I'm going to be there if, if I certainly was looking at another option um, or let the guys know on the, on the team that was that were there with us. So that was difficult, um, but, you know, getting here and hitting the ground running, these guys got a ton of momentum, and I'm sure we'll get there. Um, but it uh, seemed like the thing we needed to do, and, and uh, Coach Pendleton was kind enough to say, let's make it happen, dude. So um, here we are. Heard Chris talk about the momentum the program was talking about on a recent episode of FRL, and it was like, Man, things just just hit. They hit, and then you're looking at this having having won your team's fourth straight national title. And when does the opportunity really arise to be like, I'm I'm going to be an assistant coach at Oregon State? How does this you know opportunity really present itself? Yeah, full disclosure, it was kind of a year in the making. Uh, him him and uh, Coach Angle approached me uh, a year ago. Uh, our championships got pushed to April. Um, I saw them in June. Uh, we kind of visited. He Coach Pendleton approached me with it. My wife and I talked. Chris is pretty uh, good at his job, let's say. And so he was pushing us pretty hard and uh, and gave us the space to try and talk it, though. And and we got to a place like, man, it's just too soon. Uh, there were some some great kids who had committed to Clackamas to be there uh, this year. And so we felt like we owed it to them to, to stay there and, and, you know, be there for them. Uh, to chase that fourth uh, championship at the NJCA was obviously historical, um, and, you know, and tying the record uh, nationally for, for that division. Um, and, and just honoring the commitments that we made to those young men. So we said, hey, we're going to put a pin in it. Chris says, oh, that's great. You know, we'll circle back to you. Well, knowing full well that it, this business, not a lot of circle backs happen after you lose an opportunity, it's kind of gone. And so um, thankfully for me, mm -hmm. uh, they did circle back. We we get done with our championships, and he congratulates me. Uh, and, you know, half a point to Arizona State. We got to get this, you know, let's get together after NCAAs. And they have a great NCAAs, and, you know, um, and he actually does circle back and we get on campus uh, at, at the end of March there and talk a little more. And um, it's like, Hey man, this is, this is going to happen. So uh, here we are. <laughs> now the, the interesting thing is, is uh, we were talking just as we started, it's been 16 years. You sent the email out, you know, I get your email updates, but it was, it didn't realize that you were not there as an assistant for That was your job. Michael Uska leaves to take the job at Portland state after yeah. Marlon retires and you're, you're a head coach at 26 years old and yeah. that has been your head coaching job. So you've, you've cut your teeth. You've learned how to coach. You've learned how to do everything at yeah. Clackamas and uh, how ready are you for the division one level? You know, I think that's, that's the real question. I think in the hearts and minds of myself uh, and our, and our friends and family, like, Hey man, this guy's done it at this level. Uh, and I think the next question, if we're going to look at it and not have any regrets, is can I do my skills set translate to, to the NCAA Division One level at the highest level of wrestling collegiately? And, you know, I think that's really the challenge and the task that I have in my heart, in my mind. Um, at 26, I was doubted at Clackamas. Nobody knew who I was. I was relatively unknown as an athlete. And the hard thing about wrestling is there's sort of a glass ceiling if you haven't got an NCAA medal or uh, or a world medal uh, at the Division One level. So. Uh, a lot of opportunities in interviews uh, that I've had at this level uh, have come up with, hey, man, you just need a little more experience at, at the uh, at the level we're at. And, you know, so some of that feedback I took seriously, if I want to chase that opportunity, then I better be serious about uh, uh, putting in the work here. Um, you know, 26 years old, I was uh, faking it till I make it kind of thing <laughs> was the motto, um, because, you know, you're a little underwater there. You get transition from being an athlete to to a coach and you know, learning uh, by failing and, and failing forward really was kind of the things that I tried to take away, you know, make mistakes and learn from them. And I had some great mentors and some great people that helped me along the way too. And, um, you know, I think I'm ready, man. I really am. I'm excited. I think in recruiting, uh, the junior college division prepares you for recruiting more so than any division in wrestling. Uh, it's it's a revolving door, even if you're doing things correctly, which I feel like we were. We're graduating about half of our kids every two years. So that means I'm looking for 15 to 20 kids every single year. Um, that will not be the case at Oregon State. 
uh, we're going to be really targeted. Uh, we get to actually focus on a certain weight class, a certain type of kid. Um, and so I'm not casting a 45 to 50 kid net to kind of get 20 kids. You know what I mean? So um, a little bit of baptism by fire and recruiting, I think, prepares you for uh, for this level. Uh, obviously, the uh, the teams we're recruiting against now are, are changing uh, and evolving, which is awesome. You know, um, when you're going to talk about recruiting against, you know, hopefully a Penn State and the Michigan and teams like in Iowa and teams like that, uh, certainly, uh, you know, exciting, let's say. Well, it's also interesting is you've you've got the kids that some of these programs have been recruiting, so you know how some of them operate from recruiting your athlete perspective. Now you're going to be going, okay, I remember what these guys did when they were going after <laughs> one of my kids. So, hundred percent, hundred percent. Now, it's interesting too is uh, you know you talk about the experience at twenty, and I, you know you know, we we discovered we're pretty close to the same age anyway. But yeah, right. I I didn't become an adult. I joke I didn't become an adult till I was in my thirties after yeah. I got married. Um, and, and then I'm thinking to myself, how could I do anything uh, in a leadership role at, at 25, 26? I just got out of college days before I turned 25. And it was right. like, how, how, how? And now fast forward, here we are a decade and a half later. Uh, those of us who were not adults are now adults. So yeah. uh, talk a little bit about your growth as, as, as a person through the head coaching position to no, how you yeah, become hey, you know, my, ready for this. My journey, honestly, as an, to become an adult, started with uh, Carrie Roden and her family, to be honest with you. My wife uh, helped uh, me along the way, like, listen, if this is something you're serious about, you're going to have to be a little bit different person than maybe you've been previously. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's not to say I was terrible. It's just like, you know, you're immature, you're a knucklehead, and you're, you know, bouncing around, bebopping around with your buddies and stuff like that, and that just uh, wasn't real. And so, you know, helping, having her help me uh, kind of grow up through that process uh, making a commitment to uh, starting a young family right after being hired there at 26. We got married at 27, had uh, our daughter Ellie at 28. And, uh, you know, things started to evolve in terms of, okay, what kind of a dad do you want to be? Well, that that correlates really, really seriously with what kind of a coach do you want to be? Because you're talking about being an extension of someone's family uh, on campus in Oregon City there and now in Corvallis where you're taking care of kids from all over the country. Uh, and I take that role very seriously, just like I would with my own kids. And so – um, for me, that was no different uh, than what I was trying to do as a young dad. And, and it's just caring about people, you know, and I think that's what kind of makes me good at this. And I don't ever pat myself on the back very much, but I do love relationships. Uh, and that makes me good at this job, I feel like, because it's easier to wrestle for somebody who, you know, cares about you genuinely. Uh, and it's not just about wins and losses, right? Like there's a lot of pressure that comes with winning and losing uh, in people's minds without me adding more to that. Uh, so if relationally, I can make it a little bit easier for you to go out and compete for us uh, and know that no matter what, when you come off, we both care about the same thing, and that's you. Um, I'm going to get a lot more with these guys. One thing you just talked about a second ago prior to talking about uh, how your wife has straightened you out, because my wife has done the exact same thing. <laughs> Word. <laughs> uh, people know that. I joke about that on Twitter quite quite constantly. But uh, is is you talked about the glass ceiling and, and coming from a junior college. Uh, again, those credentials. When you look at the staff now, Chris Pendleton hired a guy named Nate Engel, who was an NAIA wrestler, he, a Greco-Roman wrestler, wrestler at Northern Michigan and didn't have the division one top till he got a chance at Air Force and then carried that with with uh, Joel Sherrod at Navy and then now all of a sudden that relationship's gone but he's got a division one assistant job at Oregon State there helping you know coach Pendleton get things yeah. done and yeah. when you saw Nate on staff did that make you think that you know what Pendleton's a little bit open to this outside of the box coaching hire thing yeah let's call it non-traditional staff how about that you know I mean yeah. just in terms of where we're at I mean obviously Isaiah and uh, Chris have more than enough credentials for everybody here. Um, but Nate is somebody who I've known from his days at Navy. Uh, we were kind of in the rec same recruiting circuit one of the years back in the day. We were, I was in Pennsylvania, NHSCAs. You know, I think it was Super 32s. You know, we just see each other, bang, bang, bang. He's like, man, you're everywhere. I said, you're everywhere, dude. And so <laughs> we just kind of started a relationship. Honestly, it wasn't like we were going to send kids to Navy from in a transfer uh, situation, but he was always just a great person, wonderful guy to be around. Um, really helpful, honestly, to me as a young guy. Uh, and then he moves to the West Coast at Stanford, and we got to see him a little bit more. We're down at the Menlo Invite and some different places. Got to train down there uh, at Stanford. Uh, you know, Nate let us come in and, and work out a little bit and got to just spend more time with the guy. And so um, what an awesome opportunity. And to be perfectly honest, I think, you know, Nate probably behind closed doors was was sort of advocating like, hey, this guy can do this. I've uh, been around him. And, and uh, you know, I think having been a non-traditional guy in, in the sense – of the word, you know, that we're talking about here at the division one coaching level, uh, I think, you know, kind of helped me have an opportunity to get into a room with coach Pendleton and, you know, have some conversations. And I've obviously known Chris for a long time as well. 
Uh, he recruited a bunch of our guys when he was at Wyoming and then at Arizona State. Um, and then again at Oregon State with, you know, Jason Shaner and Cameron came down here from our from our place. So, you know, we've had a good relationship about 12 years, you know. And so, um, you know, I think it's it's probably helped that I did a good job where I was at in terms of graduating kids and sending kids that they felt like uh, they could work with and develop uh, at the levels they were competing at. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of those things kind of spoke for themselves and went before me a little bit. And then the good Lord blessed me with an opportunity to uh, to get in a room and and uh, try and you know convince these guys that they should hire this knucklehead from Oregon City. Now, what's also interesting is, you know, at, at the junior college level, there there's a lot of people that don't really know about what's going on. They, they Some people may think of back in the day when uh, the guys were coming through last and, and you know, had a lot of yeah. D1 hammers that were coming through, and the APR changed that. Yep. Uh, we've talked about that on previous episodes, but uh, there are still Division One wrestlers that come through the junior college ranks. There are still a lot – well, actually, there's a lot of wrestlers that end up in the NAIA Division Two and Division Three, and you've put wrestlers – on podiums at every single one of those levels yeah. and you've also had a room full of d1 guys and you've had yeah. guys on the olympic ladder uh in in terms of that so talent is not something you, you you're not used to so explain yeah. you know what it's like to have you know the, the guys like tyrell fortune the guys that have the lower guys that are maybe on the rebound their second time through or the first time non-qualifier that's got that d1 ability that you're like all right my job is to do this and, and talk about coaching them from a talent situation you know, it really we were really blessed because Tyrell validated a, a young coaching staff that we just talked about. I'm 26, then 27, 28 when we're recruiting Tyrell, um, and he honestly helped validate the program. You know, in a way that I don't think uh, people really understand or grasp because I don't think people could spell the word Clackamas, let alone knew that we had wrestling or, or, or something like that. And that's not disrespect anybody else. It's just junior college wrestling is kind of obscure to some people, anyways. Um, and so for us to be able to make that jump from begging kids to come to having a kid who's the number one recruit in the country, six-time Fargo champ, seven-time finalist, uh, say yes, uh, made a big deal. And in that recruiting class, we had kids like Kagan Hanlevick from Pennsylvania, two-time state champ out there for Easton. Uh, we had Brett Sanchez from Clovis High, and Clovis was in the, in their run of, you know, going to be five state championships. Um, and so, you know, we had some yeses in that class of kids that that changed our trajectory for forever, to be perfectly honest. And so um, working with guys like that, finding kids like that, um, it really became something that I felt like we had to do uh, if we wanted to compete at the level that we wanted, that we thought we should, you know? And so um, that was the first group of guys and the first group of yeses that helped us, you know, validate that idea that, Hey, you could do this out West when a lot of people don't believe you can in wrestling. Uh, it's a, it's a Midwest, you know, East coast bias kind of sport. Um, and we certainly disproved that over the last 16 years uh, and in a big way recently. So um, we got kids from all over the Lehigh Valley, uh, the Fresno Valley and everywhere in between to uh, to say yes to coming out to God's country and helping us build something that we felt was really special. Now, how is that experience and that sales pitch going to help you in Corvallis? I think that that's a big part of why uh, these guys were like, hey, this guy can get all kinds of kids from everywhere. You know, we're, we're out, we're getting as good a recruiting class as anybody, you know, when they were still doing that for uh, Wrestling USA, I think we had five or six straight classes that were in the top three non-division one, you know, and, and I think that really helps in the sense that one, uh, you can you have connections with those areas that we all know are really really hotbeds in wrestling. Uh, you have people that you've built relationships with, and you have young men who've been successful not just at my place, but at you know Division One, Two, or Three NAIA programs, and now they're back in their areas giving back in, in the sport. And so I think there's some some real value that that adds to this coaching staff and the opportunity and the recruiting uh, and the recruiting side of things. Yeah, your career also came through in the advent of when social media really just started becoming a thing. I was actually talking with with Mike Finn yesterday, um, you know, on the phone about you know when I was tracking recruits, they weren't posting it on Twitter. Their Instagram wasn't a thing, TikTok wasn't a thing. People were just getting on Facebook, and now all of a sudden we've gone through that. The kids are making their announcements, and of course the transfer por transfer portal being what it is on the NCAA level. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that have changed. How have you evolved in terms of? Uh, that recruiting pitch that we're talking about, not just the relationship with the parent has always been one of those things that you can go back to the well and find a kid. But now it's like you're you're finding the kid that's got better grades than maybe you were looking for beforehand. You're, yeah. you're maybe going you're going for their horse that you know can get in versus yeah. hey, this kid um, he might be a right fit for us. So how does how does the mentality with the relationships with those parents and coaches at the high school level change? Yeah, you know I think to to start. Uh, at 26, I was really rigid uh, because I wouldn't text. I didn't want to text. I wanted a phone call. I wanted that's I, that's how I am. I'm relational. I love this kind of stuff. 
you know, I love rapping with guys over a beverage. I love being on the phone with people um, and kids at that point, because like you said, social media hadn't really evolved yet. And I was late to evolving with social media. I'll be honest with you. Um, text messaging to me was really like, I don't want to really do that, man. I, I want to phone call and, and talk to you. Um, I hated texting until like 2010. And I really, bro, I'm yeah. serious. I'm, I'm in the same wheelhouse as you. And it's like, okay, I guess I'm going to give in. Uh, I didn't get Facebook literally until a year ago um, when I started a Facebook page. Um, I had Instagram early and Twitter early just because, like you said, it started to become, okay, this is the way it's going. And if I don't get on board, I'm not going to be able to do my job well enough. And so um, I'm fully averse in this in the sense that I have now the three platforms that I'll keep. I do not uh, necessarily do the whole Snapchat thing. Um, but like I said. Yeah, I'm, that's a, that's that's a no for me, dog. It's I mean, fluid. it's like I like pop. I'll, I'll I'll log on like every. I mean, I'll reinstall it like every now and then. <laughs> when I was like, okay, because some people are traveling. Like, okay, you know, like Nate, for example, would always. I think Nate's got Snapchat and be like, he I does. I'd be somewhere at Worlds. But okay, three people in this huge group of people at the at the World or Olympic Championships. So it's like, all right, well, there's Nate. Okay, that's the only one that's showing up on my map. So, <laughs> okay, Nate Angle's like the one guy I can see on our trip. I, I know where Nate is, but yeah, hundred um, percent, dude. That's something he's down with, man. He gets it. He's well versed in that area. But then, like you said, more to your point, uh, how does it change? I think the general premise is the same. You know, we want your your young man to come here to have the experience that you both want him to have. Uh, we want him to get a degree and to graduate and be a successful member of society. Teach him to be a better husband, brother, friend, son you know, as he moves out into the world community member. Um, and then we also want to take care of him athletically and help him pursue his hopes, dreams, uh, both in the NCAA division and, and beyond. And so I think that that, you know, it does it change a little bit? Sure. The, the beauty of it for me is uh, I get kids for longer than a year or two, man. I felt like I was Kentucky basketball for a couple of years where guys are <laughs> shots fired. You know what Love I mean? It. And it's like, I, I'm not, but you understand like kids were doing well, nuns, man. other yeah. people want to recruit them. And, my job at that level is to, you know, get kids to where they're going and show people that we're getting kids where they want to be, not to just keep them. In a lot of junior colleges, you know, you see kids that are there for longer than uh, I would be, you know, getting a doctoral degree. So you just can't do that. And so what we did a good job of is helping kids graduate and move on. And uh, an 80 percent graduation and four year transfer rates. Awesome uh, at, at the junior college level. And that's what we were rocking with. So um, that doesn't change much other than now I get them for longer. We get to you know, really build into kids and, and you can look and find diamonds and polish them up. You got a little longer to, to work on polishing them and, and getting them, you know, to the level that they want to be at. It has nothing to do with me, man. It's it's irrespective of what I want for them other than I want what they want. And so, you know, that's exciting to be able to to cultivate those relationships and be able to be a part of their journey for a little longer than, than before. Because usually when you see them at junior college, I would see them a couple years later at camp. We'd bring them back. I'm like, dude, you're such a mature, wonderful young man right now. Where was this guy when I had him? You know what I mean? And, and and that's me. I was the junior college guy that was a knucklehead. And I'm sure coaches were like, dude, you're really a pretty good human now. You know, and what was where were you at, you know, in 98 to 2000? So it's uh, it's just part of the journey, I think, right? Yeah, one thing you talk about with the, with the one and done thing, that is one thing you were actually intending to do. You get them in, you get their yeah. one year, you get, the, you get their associates in two years so they have the maximum level of eligibility yeah. at the next level, whether that be Division One or whether that be through the NAIA. So, 100%. Um, it was yeah. by design, not necessarily what you're seeing. It's this was not a Calipari one and done. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> now, uh, circling back to this season, uh, you know, going through – uh, another championship, you know, people could say, oh, yeah, win, winning four, but you've got a different personnel as you're explaining. You don't get them for four or five years. You get them for one or two in the lineup, and you constantly have to rebuild. Now, when you, you get a group of kids like you did this past season, and, you know, it seems like everything was, was smooth sailing up until, you, you know, one of your athletes ran into a little bit of a bit of an issue in a, in a placement round and, and yeah. bad things happen when bad things happen. So sure. uh, how did you basically adjust, uh, readjust your team and say, Hey, okay, we're, we're in a dog fight now. We've, we've lost some points. Things aren't going to go our way. How did you right. as a coach get your team back on track and, and also how to deal with that athlete who was, uh, uh, you know, obviously made a, made a mistake. Yeah. You know, uh, let's start there. That was hard uh, because usually as a coach, you want to be ticked off. And I, and I, and I, part of me was, uh, but as we stood there longer going through the process and having everybody look at, you know, what happened and both those young men, um, being disqualified from the contest, um, uh, you know, your heart starts to hurt for them a little bit because, uh, if everything that I had did that was stupid was, uh, there for everyone to see in the whole wide world, uh, I would probably not be in the position that I'm in. So I, I have 
a heart that goes out for both those kids uh, in that situation. Now, as far as our team, a lot of them had gone back to the hotel because they had either, you know, the guys that had made the finals, we had four in the finals, were back at the hotel and had no idea what was going on. Um, you know, all of us that morning were so excited because mathematically at one point we locked it up after the semis. And so, um, you know, it was a wrap. Uh, and then we come back to the field 20 points. Um, and thankfully we're still in the lead. Right. And so we know that a lot of crazy things would still have had to happen for us to not win it, but it did impact, I think, a couple of performances that night, whether they want to admit that or not. I think, you know, when you feel some cold hands that would have probably been a little bit warmer knowing all I got to do is go wrestle a match instead of, I got to go win a national title, which in theory, they maybe didn't, you know, you look back at it, uh, with 2020 vision probably, but you know, they wrestled a little bit different and, you know, that's just, that's part of the being in the fire. And, and, uh, that's the reality of athletics, man. Uh, uncertain things happen in sport, you know, and, and, uh, we don't get to control as much as we like to think. And as a head coach, uh, you know, I like to think I've got a real good control on everything and man, you just don't. So we had to really talk about bouncing back and, and just, uh, you know, caring about each other and, and loving up on, on Nicholas. And, and, you know, that was part of that evening as well as just kind of, you know, Hey man, guys make mistakes. And, and, that obviously, you know, was it a big one? Sure. But I've made really big mistakes before too. And, uh, you know, I think it made it easier that Alex went out there and, and took care of business and made everybody kind of rest a little bit easier, uh, with the result. Cause we got to a place where we knew we were going to be fine. Um, uh, that could have turned out a lot, lot worse, I think it, that evening. Um, but we had a very talented group of young men too. And, and, uh, what a great group of guys just wanted to wrestle for each other. And, and, uh, gosh, they did a great job in the quarters there. You know, putting seven into the semis is no small feat. Uh, we were, you know, three points or four points away from putting nine in the semis, which is just, you know, mind blowing. Um, and then those two guys obviously wrestled back and we, we met on nine guys. So just um, I'm super grateful, man, because look, hundreds of kids and their parents said yes to trusting me and, and our staff and and Clackamas to be good to them, care about them and love them and in their journey. Um, and just how grateful we are to have built great relationships, loved on those guys and helped them uh, pursue their hopes and dreams beyond what we were able to do there in the, in the, in the wrestling room. So what's, what's, what's the program going to go forward now? Has the coach been hired yet? Uh, what's the situation with your replacement? Yeah, good question. So they have somebody that they're targeting. Um, nothing's final until it's final, right? Till the ink dries. And so, um, you know, somebody that's familiar with the program and, and that they're really excited about, uh, hopefully we can get, you know, all the yeses and, and, and things done. Uh, there so that uh, we can, you know, give the young men that are, that are hoping to stay a part of that group. And they have a good talented group coming back um, uh, to, to stay there with that, with that individual and, and uh, hopefully keep, you know, staff together and stuff like that. So really excited about the, the direction that they're trying to go and, and hoping that we can uh, make an announcement here shortly that, uh, that we got somebody locked up because I mean, I was an athlete there. I spent almost 20 years of my life uh, at Clackamas community college and in Randall hall and, um, it's near and dear to my heart. I've worked, you know, really hard to, to help make the transition with them smooth and just be super transparent because I don't want to hamstring that program. I love that program, man. It's, uh, it's definitely a piece of me is, is there no matter what. So. And looking at moving forward, obviously NCAA rules limit what you can say, or, you know, pretty much everything you can say about, uh, yeah. you know, athletes that are going to be, you know, rec you're actually recruiting, but, sure. uh, I guess Pretty much, people are going to assume some of those some of those hammers may end up uh, taking a, a recruiting trip or two to Corvallis. So, uh, you know, there's some pretty good ones there. You you have to now re-recruit, right? Yeah, I mean, if if we if we want to be a part of their process going forward, once they finish this year uh, in residence for the freshman guys or the sophomore guys, you know, we can circle back and, and talk to them and and hopefully be a part of of what they're thinking uh, for in the future. Uh, there's some very very good young men and great you know just dudes. Uh, that I would love to continue uh, getting the opportunity to work with, but you know, like you said, we got to be uh, casual with what we're uh, what we're saying, and and uh, nothing but a lot of love for those young men, and, and definitely want to see them be successful beyond uh, their time there at Clackamas. We look at what Chris and, and Nate and Mike and this and Isaiah did, the staff, yeah. you know, hitting the you know hitting what they did, hitting the benchmarks they did, you know, year two. Uh, in the program and, you know, Chris talking about, you know, practice strategies and, and things that have changed over the years and, and, you know, being being without a chance to meet the guys when him and, and Nate first, you know, got there with, with COVID being what it is. But uh, what about the energy in, in Corvallis? What have you seen from a distance 
from that program that, that makes this something that you that you also sought after and and the people of the state of Oregon should be seeking more information on they should be able to they should be coming to to the the home matches they should be able to fill the fill the stands for these type of things where's yeah, the energy I mean, at yeah let's just frame it where you started with covid i mean imagine being in a state that doesn't let you even get hired uh, because everything's closed uh until a month and a half in you know and chris gets the opportunity to get hired and he's still working and doing everything he needs to do um meeting the young men that are going to be a part of what they're doing those guys finally getting in the building and then having to navigate all the craziness that myself at Clackamas and, and these guys had to navigate as a part of that COVID process. Um, you know, not having a recruiting experience for a lot of these kids, um, you know, trying to figure out what that looks like as you build a team and a philosophy and everything else. Um, Cause a lot of my thing at Clackamas was, Hey, trust me, I'm going to take care of you in this. And it's like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Cause there's, there's time spent, already that you've got with me now these guys are new and saying hey trust us and and the craziness is they got they got buy-in they got trust they built that uh and they cultivated that culture and i hate to say culture and family a lot because everybody says that in recruiting and those for me aren't buzzwords i actually that's what i mean and you know i believe my daughter's like a little girl i remember the titans when we're wrestling because she's screaming my guy is stalling um when i'm like pump the brakes sissy you know like <laughs> yeah, he is, but we need to win this match. You know, she gets it. Um, that's true. Like it's family. Uh, he's built an awesome culture here. There's a ton of young men that are in this room each day, uh, down at lifts with coach Mike, uh, that are putting in time in the off season, uh, when a lot of places, you know, and I've been, at, when I've been at Clackamas, there's a lot of asking guys to, you know, get to work in the springtime. Uh, I see a, a, a lot of guys that are, you know, volunteer army that are here doing the work and putting the time in. And these guys are, are serious about their training right now. And, I think that's that's really exceptional to see um, a, a, as that doesn't happen everywhere, you know, and, and I don't have to to say that's true. We both know that that's true in spring and, and, and summertime. So um, just, you know, what a great uh, year they had. You know, you liken it to, to the basketball. We call it March Madness. Right. But uh, I mean, talk about a Cinderella story. You know, they're 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 an elite eight or a final four team with the way that they performed. Uh, and how well they they finished the season and, and kids were wrestling hard and and, uh, you know, winning huge matches and, and overcoming adversity and just, you know, what a great two years that they have put in here. Um, and so from a, from my perspective, it's like, hey, you know, how many people really get to jump on a top 12 staff uh, at any point from any place, uh, let alone you know, from the seat I was sitting in. And so it just made a lot of sense for me, you know, for people in Oregon and, and the Pacific Northwest, this is, this is a flagship. You know, if we, if, if you're serious about wanting wrestling to come back places, then you got to be serious about getting into places and, and showing an administration that you're serious about wrestling. Um, it's hard to do if we just talk about it on a message board or we talk about it amongst ourselves and our buddies. Um, but if you really want to get serious about it, I'm bringing my team down. I brought Clackamas down here several times uh, throughout my 16 years. Uh, to come watch wrestling here um when oregon hosted the uh oh all-star all-star classic we took 40 kids down there right like you got to be serious and put time effort and energy into saying yeah this is important to us and and if the goal for someone at washington is to get university of washington to start wrestling well we gotta we gotta show it's viable where we're at and so what better time than now to jump in and say yes to oregon state wrestling i mean i can't think of a better time in the last you know since i was in high school 1996 uh, where they had more all americans or, or you know coach zusky had a, a top eight finish and you know this is a top 12 and so it's like hey let's get really serious about uh expanding what they're doing here and seeing how we can best help these these coaches and these athletes uh, have the experience and the opportunity that they want to push this thing forward and and be the flagship program um out here in the pacific northwest where you know people will say it's it is a little bit on a wrestling island well guess what uh we were able to do it up north uh, and so I don't see any reason why we can't find a way to help these guys uh, get the hopes, dreams, and, and uh, you know, legacy to where we all want it to be out here at Oregon State University. Now moving to some more of the fun things that uh, yeah. wrestling coaches get to chat about. You've got a swoosh on your chest, and that is that is yeah. a Nike school. So, uh, and I understand. I, I was told that uh, that you're a bit of a shoe guy. So now I, I do, do like have. Shoes. You have to put put away some pairs of shoes, and it, it's basically now it's 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 you got you you can actually rock yourself some Dunks, some Jordans, some Air Maxes now, and and and, and be you know looking the part with with sure. your arms there. Yeah. So full disclosure. Oh my God. Hey, there's Chris. Coach P. 
Yeah, Chris yeah. has actually been in this house. Granted, the last time he said, now if you're watching, you're not watching on video, you don't know this, but uh, Chris was actually the first guest in what this used to look like. It, it doesn't look like this either. anymore. So, yeah, so Chris, I'm going to turn the light on. So this is, uh, next time you come to visit, you get to do the show from the bar. Uh, so a five-time national champion, though, that lives a couple blocks from your house, I'll be right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Although we'll have to do that when there's not a football game in the snow yeah. in October. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll leave that particular home visit out. But uh, that was the one thing before we started the show today. She, my wife is like, who are you got on the show? I was like, Josh Roden is a Clackamas. And she's seen the Clackamas shirts because sure. uh, the clack, the clack, the clack thing, I'm going to take a little credit for. Dude, that was you, man. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not even, it was you. And I, I said such on social media. I told everybody copyrights is JB, man. She's like, okay. Oh, he's coaching where Nate and Chris are at. Right. And I'm like, Boom! Check the boxes. My wife is following wrestling. She's so, uh, in, dude. She's an Oregon State fan. Yeah. Well, there's there there might be a shortage of Oregon State gear here. Uh, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Now, now, talk. Uh, getting back to the shoes because this yes, is something I'm looking forward to because I came prepared. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna say. You got, you got props. What are we, I'm just gonna brought this up. I'm, I'm gonna say I'm gonna start with my Cardinal three Jordan threes. Now I've only had these a little bit, but uh, I, I found that the threes, this is my only pair of threes that, okay. uh, and I'm going to do a full shoe show with, with Ryan Holmes. And we're going to get Kevin Clonch to talk about the wrestling shoes, trying to get Jacob Casper, AKA uh, Mr. Creed from the WWE uh, yes. on there to talk shoes. But, and you're a shoe guy. What, like, what is your go-to when it comes to I'm coaching in the corner what do I have to wear? Does it depend on what, what colors you're wearing? Okay. Now you've got some orange to go. How do, how do you coordinate your shoe game? So full disclosure, I got a pair of Navy Air Force Ones that uh, I've got in a, in three, no, four now of the championship photos. So uh, that was sort of the, the thing that I felt like, you know, I'm a little superstitious, not in everything, but in that I was like, hey, I switched the suit this year and I was, I was stressed about that as the points changed and my wife's like, you're an idiot. That's not even a thing. And she was right. It wasn't. Um, and I am an idiot. So now full disclosure, I text coach angle uh, and I said, Hey, if I'm going to be a part of the staff, I guess I better get these. And it's a pair of black air force ones with the orange swoosh. And so those get in Friday. Um, I was going to debut them in Vegas, but since you put me on the spot and we're asking about shoes, I was like, okay, I better just, uh, did you, you make a run at the, uh, the Halloween dunks? I did not dude. There's a, there's a limit in my house. Uh, and the, and the boss on math in the math department at my home, is Mrs. Roden. So there's only so much money that can get spent on accessories. And uh, so that was one of the items I decided to go with. Yeah, it's off camera here, but I'm looking over to my my shoe wall, which I created during COVID. I blame Clonch and I, bring, I blame Richard Emmel for really getting me into the Jordans. And then uh, <laughs> Robbie Smith planted the seed a couple years ago. There's a Greco tie. He goes, why don't you get some Jordans, man? Because UWW and USA Wrestling are, are Nike. And I'm like, well, and I had been, you know, obviously, you know, with the Oregon thing, I had been anti-Nike forever. Sure. And now I see that they're, you know, giving into wrestling. I'm like, all right, well, I can wear it. And then I realize, okay, these these actually, uh, you know, again, part of that becoming an adult. So speaking yeah. of the Air Force, one Let's i actually got this ready i actually got this guy oh this is the shamrock air force one i got specific i i bought this shoe for one day i bought it for saint patty's day at division ones and you got because to this is i yeah and and hazard had the hat i had this thing you can see if you're on the camera you can see the shamrocks are all embedded to it so i've got three pair air force ones but this one's probably my favorite the other one also Oregon kind of themed. It's the Portland Trailblazer uh, 75th anniversary Air Force ones that, that are black, what red and uh, and gray. But now I, I also got to say, do you have a specific pair of shoes for finals? Because I'm leading into that. You say you got your championship photo. Do you have anything that's like, okay, this is a tournament final. I got to wear something different here. You know, because uh, we used to do Adidas a lot, and so I have I have some affinity for the Adidas shoe a little bit. Now I'm I'm in Nike school, so I gotta I gotta find myself a little bit. But I would always. Uh, I love the, um, why am I blanking on? I was going to say, you're not wearing foam runners or something like that. Oh, hey, right <laughs> oh okay. Yeah, you got those there. There we go. But, um, yeah, no, I like I like I like some of those. I, I got to go comfortable, dude. I'm getting old. Cause if you're on concrete for a long time, the back and the knees start to hurt. So I got to get soft shoes. Right. But when you gotta be, when you're a shoe guy, you gotta make sure that you have some, even if they're uncomfortable, this is what my wife tells me, right? If with the Jimmy Choo shoe, it's uh, if it's uncomfortable, that means it looks good. So um, I guess that's why I wear the Air Force Ones on in the finals and not all day. Um, we're gonna see how well these uh, these new orange and, and black ones feel. Um, but I also know you can't wear them very much because they crease, right? And when they crease, my guys give me a bad time. Well, here's the thing. You know, I learned this about the shoe thing with the creases. They're shoes. 
They're made you know, to be I, worn. They so are. they're good. And thing is, I got a wide foot. So, and if you're not into the shoe talk, you can check out right now yeah. <laughs> uh, and check out Josh Roden on, on social media and, and, you know, what's going on at, at you know, building the dam. No, but uh, what I've found is like, okay, yeah, I keep them. I put the shoe trees in them when I'm not wearing them. That eliminates, sure. but I'm also a, thir- a 12 and a half Air Force One, kind of 12 a lot if they're wide, but a 13 in a lot of these, these Nikes. So, that the bigger the foot and the more the edge, you're gonna you're gonna crease it. But what I found is I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little I'm gonna do a little, little flex here. I got the pandas. I hit on the pandas a couple weeks ago when nice. I'm in Budapest. But I'm doing the old man thing. Look what I've got in here. I put a Dr. Scholl's insert in, <laughs> so it's the cushioning. It gives me a little bit more pressure, and I can wear these all day. See that? Instead I'm gonna of, have to take that out. I'm gonna dude, steal that. Seriously, and you know because. You know, between between that and what my wife calls the uh, the, the the ketchup and mustard dunks, Those they are look nice. they look very, they look Iowa State, they look Minnesota, they look uh, Pocosin, little yeah, little you, homeschool. Yeah, you're very versatile, man. So, I see a lot yeah. of versatility amongst your shoe collection. Yeah, and I've even brought up. You know, I talk about final shoes. I got to do this. I, this is mostly me to brag about my shoes. No, I love it. I I'm, I'm totally so, in. Here's my final shoes. I got oh, my my nice. my my metallic gold. Granted, they're mids, so the the shoe the shoe people will will clown me because they're mids because they've got the jump man on the tongue instead of the Nike Air. So these are yeah. finals. They only get worn. This is one pair. Of my wife went and goes. I was like, "What do you need those for?" I'm like, "Final." She goes, "Okay." Like it's one of those things. Like it makes sense. She will she will definitely not sign off on some of these things. And then uh, you know, and I announced Little Rock. If you're familiar with the Little Rock color scheme, when yep. when the Bordeaux dropped, <laughs> got the Jordan One Bordeaux. So, um, you know, the, and then of course the last well, those humble, could be those could also be your wine drinking shoes. I mean, they are. They're also the also my my last humble brag. I got to throw this the very first pair of Jordan Ones I ever got. Oh, nice. These are the dark mochas, and I realized what in the world am I doing with these pair? I uh, like those a lot. To find yeah. out, it's one of those ones that uh, you. I did hit the Travis Scott fragments, and I sold them, which basically paid for all of this stuff. So it's not like I'm throwing all of the, the Patreon contributions into uh, and the team membership for those watching the show. Uh, Edit shoes. No, I bought a pair of Travis Scott's for resale and hit and retail, like 150 bucks, I think they were, and I sold them for over $1,000, which paid for all of the shoes. So Isn't it crazy? I mean, it's nuts. To me, it's wild because when I first started understanding this, because I, I mean, I had 91 Jordans in 1991. Uh, I had the 92s. I had to work, you know, I'm mowing lawns and doing things because my mom and my mom and dad are like, I'm not paying that much money for shoes. Oh Thankfully, no, I, $50 for a pair of shoes was unheard of where dude, I, when I was growing up. Yeah. It's wild. Right. And it's like, Oh, those are 110 bucks or something. My $200 uncle, pair of shoes. Are you kidding me? Yeah. My <laughs> uncle Nick worked at Nike. So we got to go to the employee store. So I had to, you know, I worked to get the 50% off price. Uh, got the 91s and I had the 92s. Right. Um, and well, do you have like, the ones, the, because I, the, I had a pair of the fours, they didn't fit very well. And I kind of offloaded them. So I wish I could have hold on, held on to those because flash forward, my team goes to my parents' house for a little getaway, uh, up at their property. And my brother had, uh, some John Smith's, the originals, like the black and white ones, uh, and wrestling shoes. And they're like, Oh coach, you could sell these for, you know, 500 bucks. I'm like, whatever, dude, that's not even a thing. And one of the guys is like, Hey, I need some shoes. And these are a size 12. Can I have them? I'm like, sure. No problem. And they're like, you're just going to give them to them. I didn't know the shoes were that big of a thing then. <laughs> now, obviously, you and I both know that. And I look at my wrestling shoes. I mean, I have three pair, four pair of wrestling shoes because obviously the last time I stepped on a mat was was very, very bad. I think Jake Clark <laughs> drug me out to Minnesota Storm practice to play soccer. Yeah. I was sore for about a month after that. So, uh, you know, I bought the Snyders from from Rudis because they were the very first ones. You know, it was Olympic sure. I got to get some, you know, something unique from my era. Yeah. Uh, the combat speeds got re-released, uh, the teal. So I was like, okay, got to have those. those. Uh, the Jordan 2 pack. And then I got the pair that, that Steve Martin gave me when he first got the job at ODU, a pair of like A6 split-second fours that I wore so – I wore them a lot that summer uh, with my club back in Virginia, but I, I didn't even wear them enough to really break them in. So um, I was like, when she sees me buying a re- pair of wrestling shoes, she just shakes her head because there's no way they're getting worn for their intended purpose. They're, right. they're, 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 they're decorative here. Kind of like the, you know, I've got all the Burroughs cross trainers plus, you know, is, is two packs. I don't have one of his gold ones though. I'm thinking I probably should have picked one of those up and he's, yeah, he's jump shipped sure. over, over his, but the shoe thing, again, this is just, just the tip of the iceberg. Cause me and Richard talk about this all the time. And then when Nate told me, dude, he's into shoes. I'm like, we're, we're, we're going to at least get the shoe talk in here. Nate is educating me because he is into shoes, man. He, he, Full disclosure, he says uh, the other day he's got a pair that he has to send back because he probably shouldn't have got them yet, you know. So he's, you know, he's that. I kind did. Of- I have sent a couple back because um, I looked at them like 
it's just not me. And then one, I found out that I found out the hard way that I'm not a 12 and a half in Jordan ones. Cause <laughs> you couldn't get them on. I'm like, I no no. And I looked at the resale. I'm like, I'm not even going to, I might get my money back for these. I'll just send them back, you know, membership yeah. on, on the Nike app, the sneakers That's app. Funny. So a little extra, extra, um, extra, I guess, marketing here for the swoosh there, but, uh, yeah, Hey, they- they're, they're, they're into wrestling again. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's amusing. Cause stalemates dropped the old, uh, the Oregon, I uh, did a little video about uh, is Nike responsible for Oregon a couple weeks, ago, a couple days ago, and I'm like, let's are we gonna revisit that again? But to, to Zach's credit, he did give give them credit for getting into wrestling internationally with uh, with yeah. UWW and USA Wrestling. So no, that's uh, awesome. A lot of the old timers, and you know, I'm still waiting for for that school up in up in Eugene to to give you guys another rival again. Um, but uh, you know, who knows? But that's uh, that's another topic, another school. We're we're talking about the Beavers, not about the whatever that is up there. Hundred percent. All right, Josh. Final word uh, as we can we can shelf we can shelf the shoe conversation. I can put my shoes back on the shelf. Uh, what's what's next for you? Uh, you know, was was there a move involved as far as people looking at geography? I mean, how are you getting settled with the new gig, and and what's the next step for you? You know, I think just trying to figure out how I can best help these guys. I mean, they've got something awesome and special going on here. Uh, I certainly just want to try and you know take some of the load off of their their plates. I know that they're you know they work tirelessly. I know know all these guys really well, and so if I can you know shoulder some of the burden, uh, make it a little bit easier to uh, do the things that and focus on the, the athletes and the things that they need to focus on, um, then I'm going to try and do that to the best of my ability, man. That's uh, that's part of the thing I I don't shy away from. I'm not afraid to work. I'm not afraid of long days and, and uh, early mornings. So. Um, those, you don't earn, you earn the nickname. It's, it's not given the nickname road dog. It's earned. And so I've certainly, uh, been doing some traveling, you know, well, driving humble brag right there. I see. Not, yeah, no, a hundred percent. dude. So, um, it's not that far from where we actually live in the community of Oregon city. It's about an hour or so drive on freeway. So, um, I've been doing that right now and just trying to figure out really, like you said, what's the, what's the next step for us in terms of what this looks like. And, um, you know, I got a daughter who's going to be a freshman in high school and loves her friend group. So I may be being the road dog a little bit more uh, than my 30 second commute for 16 years. But uh, I think, you know, that's a huge part of of what's been successful for us, too, is uh, having my family be supportive of what's going on. And so they're super excited as well. And my son, he's really, really pumped about it. And, and uh, he's one of his favorite guys at Clackamas, Jason Shaner's down here as a bead. And so he's excited to get to to play with him a little bit more and see him. A little bit too. So um Exciting times, man. I tell you, I do have to get a little bit better at uh, Smash Bros. My son has been helping me at home because these guys are pretty good out here. Isaiah's like exceptional. Um, I have to write this one down because I'm, I'm just digging into the cool. Mario Party now. So Dude, I got, I got girls. So these guys and Smash Bros. My son loves Smash Bros. So when I came home the other night, I told him I got beat pretty bad, and he goes, "Well, Dad, maybe you just need to practice." And so we went and practiced at home uh, some Smash Bros. And he helped me uh, get better. I told him the next day that I actually won a couple, and so. He said, see, dad, practice works. So we're we're building on the idea that practice is a good thing uh, through video gaming, if that makes any sense to anybody. So it's it Wednesday's game night around here. And yeah. with with the nine year old and the five year old, the and Ruby, the five year old, will basically okay, set it up. She turns on the we got a switch. So um, I hadn't had a game system since the PS2 that's somewhere behind me. Yeah, for sure, but, dude. Yeah. I think I bought in like I can't, I was living I was living in Virginia when I bought that thing. I don't know tell you how long ago that was. So <laughs> it's at the point where we've got the four controllers playing playing Mario. Uh, we were playing Mario Kart 8 last night. And then when Ruby realizes she's not going to win the race, she runs over and switches controllers with whoever's <laughs> winning. So I, I'm, and I'm not even driving. I basically set it to where I've got the slowest car. I set everything down low and I just, just, push so i'm not winning so i don't win right. all the races because right. i will crush everybody in the house in mario Kart. <laughs> but it was just like uh and then here comes ruby i want to be first grabs it was like okay and then i just start moving and then i'm in thursday dad you still finished ahead of me so uh you know what i got i got one that hates to lose so uh you I got understand. one that likes practice i gotta work on the whole like losing with class kind of thing we have uh, a competitive house too unfortunately so we have to figure that out at times at our house too because uno gets real serious when my daughter isn't winning so uh, do you, have you seen the the giannis unos by the way i have, the, I have the not air, oh air force ones uh the, some some nike dropped the the uno themed air force ones because they're doing a whole like uh i can't remember what they what the the basketball shoe was because i'm not really into those but it was like a, a uno theme because oh, Giannis nice. from the Bucks is into him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depends on your shoe size. There might be some left because they didn't have any 13s by the time I looked. That's one of those things my wife goes, 
cool shoe, not practical. So that means not you're not practical. getting it. But, Don't do uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lastly, is uh, let's let's close out with some video game chat, just because. What is the one video game your wife kicked your ass in? The one video game that Carrie kicked my butt at would be. Gosh, it's got to be golf. Uh, Tiger Woods golf from what did we have before? We had the Wii. It's the Wii. Yeah, on the Wii. She's she's good at golf. She was a college golfer, so it's like okay, fine, whatever. I do play that. Uh, I think I play the the two K one on the Switch because I think I bought it for like five bucks on a sale in the Nintendo store. But uh, I just yeah. had to throw this out to give my wife one more one more uh, pat on the back because. She's in the office down here. She can sometimes hear these conversations as we're yeah, right. uh, Dr. Mario is where she still just dominates. So She's money um, at it. Yeah, still money. I might get her a couple times as it just but uh, for the most part um as it's 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 I just can't do it. Plus I have the two little girls jumping in front of me blocking right. my view so mom can win. So yeah, they're not, not only does she she doesn't need my need their help to beat me but she just does. But That's funny. All right, choose video games and a new generation of beaver. Yeah. There in Corvallis. So uh, clack to clack to clack to clack doesn't quite have the ring yeah. of it, but congratulations on that fourth championship in a row, fifth overall, sixth in the school's history, uh, on your way out the door. And yeah. good luck to you in Corvallis with uh, with that crew you've got there uh, in the office. Thank you, buddy. I'm excited about it. Can't wait to uh, to get to uh, you know really grinding with these guys because uh, they've got something special going on here, man. Everybody should check it out. Let's build that dam. <laughs>